Hello, everyone. Welcome into September. Today being September 1st. I don't know about you, but uh, the month kind of snuck up on me. It's the uh, end of the summer here in Chicago. Um, starting to feel like fall. Welcome to Cup of Joe for September. My name is Mike Carrazzo. I'm the content manager here at Ryerson, joined always by Nick Webb. He's our director of risk management, commodities, hedging. Hello, Nick. Hello, Mike. How are you doing today? Doing good. I am doing well. And our guest this month is a man we've been trying to pin down for months. <laughs> uh, it's men in aluminum, I guess, these days. Jeff Notice, um, a director of supply chain here at Ryerson, um, covering a lot of different areas, but I'm um, going to talk specifically on aluminum uh, this month. Jeff, welcome to Cup of Joe. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, a um, few reminders here. If uh, this is your first time, welcome. We do this the first Thursday of every month. It's a commodities talk, um, looking at market conditions, um, as well as individual, um, into the macro and micro. Um, and if you're returning, thanks for joining us again. We're, uh, we'll uh, have a full recording of this available um, right after this. But um, without further ado, Nick, I'm gonna kick the screen over to you. Excellent. Let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. We have a lot to cover today. There is plenty going on in the world of commodities and, and really the world of the, the macro environment as well. Um, as always, we have to cover our safe harbor provision. These are the opinions of Nick Webb, Mike Carrazzo, and Jeff Notice. Um, do your own research. We're doing our best, you know, coming up with our own stuff, but I uh, would certainly encourage you to, to also do your, your own research to, comp, to kind of complement what we're, what we're working on here. Um, before I hop into the macro side of things, I will give a slight warning. There are some charts in here that are a little scary, a little Dr. Doomish, um, but I do want to highlight one key overarching idea, which is within the global economy, um, it still remains the case, in my opinion, opinion, that the United States remains kind of the diamond in the rough. So on a relative basis, whatever's happening in other parts of the world, it looks like it's going to be less bad here. Um, and then even more specifically, whatever's happening within the United States, I would argue that on a relative basis, the manufacturing sector actually looks like it should hold up better. So what am I talking about here? Uh, I really enjoy this chart, and I apologize if, if you're getting blocked a little bit by our screens, but we've looked at this in the past, but what this is, is purchasing managers index data. So this is, again, a survey that goes out to thousands upon thousands of purchasing managers, asking them whether or not they're seeing conditions getting better, worse, prices going up, they're going down, our backlogs, and then they, they compile these surveys, and they do it on a global basis. So what we're looking at here is the last 12 months of PMI data. So going left to right, September 2021 through August of 2022. And as you can see pretty, pretty clearly, as you go from left to right, we're moving out of a lot of green territory into a lot more yellow and even a bit more red uh, as we work our way to the right-hand side. And a couple of things I, I really want to highlight, uh, first of which is going to be China. Uh, just in the last 24 hours, China, unfortunately, has announced another round of lockdowns this time, about 21 million people. So not, not as big as what it has been in the past. It's one of their smaller cities, which is kind of crazy to say, considering it's 21 million people. But, uh, but as you can see here within the, in the manufacturing data, their PMIs have softened back below 50, having been above 50 for the last uh, number of months or last couple of months. Um, moving down the list a little bit. We're going to spend a little a little bit of time here in a few slides talking about Europe, but there's no doubt about it. Europe is having a tough go of it right now. Um, you've probably seen some of the headlines with regards to their lack of energy security, power prices going to the moon. We've got some charts here here in this presentation that are going to run through some of that in more detail and uh, and talk about some of the, the knock on implications that may have to metals. Now, I don't know what the heck is going on in India but they are, they are really the key one that's sort of bucking the trend to the upside. Uh, you can see them midway down, 56 PMI. That's, that's a pretty darn strong PMI data point in the face of the rest of the world, really kind of hitting a little bit of a slow patch. And then lastly, working our way down to the United States, three from the bottom. Yes, we're softening. Growth rates are softening here within the United States, but it's still growth on a year-over-year -year basis. So that is, that is worth highlighting. I want, I want to make sure that that's digested in the face of some of these maybe ugly charts that I show here, here in a few. 
Hey, Nick, question. Um, India um, growing strong, like you said. What's uh, What are some key maybe exports or commodities that are made out of that region? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're big exporters of steel. They're big exporters of iron ore. Um, they certainly have their own domestic coal market where they export some of that. But um, yeah, they're, they're, they're big net imp importers of a lot of things as well. And, you know, I, I hate to be too cynical here, but there is a chance that some of what Europe's issues are, are becoming beneficiaries for, for India. And what I mean by that is there's a chance that India is actually consuming more Russian natural gas, more Russian crude oil in the face of Europe putting up its own sanctions. So um, that, that could be one of the things that, that's been going on over the last couple of months, is they're actually getting cheaper, cheaper energy. And I don't know if you're gonna to get to it in a few slides, but um, parking in on China there for a little bit um, beyond that PMI data that came out. Um, I don't know if you're gonna mention it, but steel production down month over month there, right? Is that? Um, yeah, yeah, you can actually, right? yeah, so Mike, Mike just uh, about a week ago sent me, a, sent me an article. Um, Highlighting the fact that, and, and some of these things are no, no real secret, we've talked about them in months past, but the property sector within China is quite weak. That obviously has knock-on implications to demand for commodities, and one of those being steel. We'll talk about it here in a few slides, but steel prices within China are several hundred dollars lower than where they are in Europe and the United States. And, uh, and that can be constraining to profitability. And, and the article that he had sent me was suggesting that Estimates are around 30% of their steel industry is at risk of going bankrupt. Um, why does that matter? Well, on one hand, that, that's bad news because you know companies are going bankrupt. On the other hand, the, the potential knock-on impl implications that a 30% you know, of China's steel companies going bankrupt would have almost instantaneously, if that happened, that would better balance global supply demand conditions for steel. So in a weird way, you could actually see that propping up uh, other markets outside of China with the with the steel steel pricing. Yeah, yeah really appreciate bringing that up. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about you know kind of the Fed's goals over the over the coming months in in, in prior podcasts, and I, I I promised myself I wasn't going to say the R word, but um, in my opinion, the Fed's kind of trapped, and, and they're trapped between two two bumpers really, and, and the first of which is going to be inflation. That's the obvious one. Um, inflation rates are running around 40 year highs, basically the highest since the 1970s. And the Fed is doing its best to try and bring that back down to more reasonable, reasonable levels, no matter where you look, whether it's food prices, energy prices, um, you know, airline tickets, things are more expensive now than where they were a year ago, two years ago, at a pretty rapid pace as well. So that's the first task that, that the Fed's really trying to take on um, full force. Unfortunately, they can't just do that magically. They can't just wave a wand and bring inflation back down. One way that they can do that is to kind of damage the economy, either on a domestic basis or on a global basis. So towing that, that middle ground is looking to me to be incredibly difficult where, yeah, we might be able to bring the prices of energy down. We might be able to bring the prices of food down and get people to stop spending more. But will that send us into a recession? And, and God forbid, maybe that sends us into a deep recession. And we actually see, you know, negative several percent GDP growth. In some scenarios, I think that may actually be required because, unfortunately, things like energy aren't really fixed by bringing on, or, you know, bringing up interest rates. And, and Jay Powell has kind of acknowledged that in prior prior months, where he's basically said, "I can bring up interest rates as far as I want. It doesn't create more natural gas. Doesn't create more electricity. So other things perhaps need to take place to bring those things down." But what the Fed has also acknowledged is, so I guess if we take a step back and we say, all right, what is the Fed watching or what, is, what can we as you know, purveyors of the Fed's dialogue, what can we be watching to kind of understand their perspective? Well, the first of which is going to be obviously the inflationary data. And more specifically, the Fed indicates that they look primarily at core inflation. So core inflation being any inflationary data, excluding food and energy prices. That's gonna be shown here on, here on this chart in the white line. And you can see for the last couple of months, core inflation has actually started to creep down a little bit. Um, admittedly, even in the last month, headline inflation has even come off from its, all, you know, from its 40 year high, albeit still very, very elevated levels. Four and a half percent on core inflation. Yeah, it's good that it's, it's ticked down over the last couple of months. It's nowhere near where they want it to be. I don't wanna put words in their mouth, but I would say 
know, they're not really going to, they being the Federal Reserve uh, Bank presidents, they aren't really going to get comfortable until they start seeing rates somewhere south of probably 3%, maybe closer to 2%, because we've seen prices rise very rapidly uh, for the last many months. So that's the first thing we're going to keep an eye on is core inflation. The second is, is jobs data. So ultimately, you know, as the Fed is hiking interest rates, and that has some sort of a headwind effect to the housing market, the auto market, construction markets. Um, one of the big things they're going to be watching is, is that causing layoffs? Is that causing people to lose their jobs? So we're going to be watching jobs data very closely in the coming weeks and months ahead as well. One of the data points that I think we touched on last month is this chart here, which is the JOLTS job openings here in the United States. And within the United States, we've currently got 11.2 million job openings still out there. And, and I know I mentioned last month that I thought we were in a recession already because of you know, the two quarters of negative GDP. I will readily admit that if there's a contradic contradiction to that idea of us being in a recession, it's jobs data. If we look at jobs alone, this data is extremely strong. You can see it in the job openings here on this chart. If you look at the unemployment rate right now, it's about three and a half percent, which is extremely low. So if we are in fact in a recession, it's the weirdest recession we've ever had because jobs are very plentiful. And for anybody who gets laid off, there are jobs that are out there to be had. They may not be your dream job, but they do exist. So until or unless we see a lot of layoffs and the unemployment rate move up or job openings move down, the Fed kind of feels a little emboldened to continue hiking rates, continue chopping away at the economy a little bit until or unless things really calm down. Their ultimate goal is that people stop spending money at quite the rate that they have been over the last uh, several, several months and quarters. Now, on the inflation side of things, one of the big contributors, obviously, is, is energy, at least on the, he the headline CPI number. Um, what we're looking at here is going to be the white line is crude oil. The blue line is diesel fuel prices, which we'll touch on again here when we talk aluminum. Um, but admittedly, over the last several months, basically since, let's call it April, we have seen crude oil and refined products come off their highs to a fairly large clip. Let's call it 20%. Um, that should help to feed through to lower CPI data, at least for now. While we're on the topic of crude oil and refined products, I think it's worth noting in the last several days, uh, some OPEC members, so the oil producing regions of the world, uh, their, their key you know, heads have come out and said, and it's a little cryptic how they said it, but they basically said financial markets, so basically futures and, and things that are traded on the exchanges, seem to be deviating a little bit from what they see with physical supply demand markets. Now, I don't know if they're alleging that maybe some, somebody's behind the scenes shorting futures markets and trying to make prices come down, but they did kind of give this hint that if in the event that doesn't correct, OPEC will have no issue cutting production. So kind of a kind of goes in the face of what the Fed is trying to achieve, which is bringing inflation down. Here's OPEC basically saying, well, if, if we see too much deflation in, in energy markets, we'll actually take production away from the market, which is kind of the opposite of what I think we want to see or what the Fed would want to see if they're trying to bring prices down. So for now, we are seeing energy prices soften on crude oil and refined products. Um, but that could change. And, and worth noting, uh, OPEC does have a, a, a fairly important meeting coming up, I think, in two days, so October 3rd. Now, while crude oil and refined products are, are softening a bit over the last several months, the other side of the ener energy equation, and I'll call this the kind of heating of things, the making of things, uh, so we're talking coal, natural gas, electricity. Those markets, unfortunately, have not cooperated. And you can see that here. We, we've talked about this chart in the past. The blue line is going to be U.S. natural gas prices, which it doesn't look like it, but $9.30 for U.S. natural gas is very high relative to history. It's basically the highest level in 11 or 12 years. So we're seeing the inflation already in the U.S., but comparing that to what they're seeing in Europe, and it, both of these are in U.S. dollars per MMBTU, uh, so British thermal units. The price in Europe is about eight times higher than what we're seeing here within the U.S., so when we, when we start to think about the, the ramifications of lack of energy security, you know, the war going on Russia-Ukraine, uh, any type of lever pulling that happens even within, within OPEC, 
uh, these are certainly having more dramatic impacts in places like Europe who have less energy security. And, and this is one of the main reasons why I think on a relative basis, the United States and the United States manufacturing sector is going to be much, much better off. We still might feel some pain, but if you compare that to what they're seeing in Europe right now, it's it's pseudo panic. Um, and I don't I don't mean to be too hyperbolic, but uh, you'll see here in another slide what I mean by panic. This is the price of electricity in Europe. So we're looking at France and we're looking at Germany. It's a five year chart. And what we're looking at specifically is gonna be base load one year forward energy. The idea there is basically to pull an index that's normally somewhat stable. So you can see 2017 to 2020, 21, um, you basically had power prices right around 40 bucks and a, a kilowatt hour. We're now looking at prices in Germany and France, basically the two big manufacturing hubs of Europe with electricity prices more than 10 times that historical average. So whether you're trying to make something or heat your home or pretty much anything you wanna do requires turning the lights on, heating your home or you know, melting a product, burning a product within manufacturing. And what's kind of crazy is as we look at this chart, you're seeing those jolts up. If we, if we ran these, these charts three days ago, they would have been showing prices double what we're even seeing right now. So it's a pretty crazy situation over there. Um, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to spend too, too much time on this, but I will say there will be, or there very well could be knock on implications of aluminum curtailments. We're already seeing some of that. Um, but if this continues, as we roll into fall, we roll into winter, um, the higher electricity prices go, the more difficult it is to make aluminum profit profitably, to make zinc profitably. But admittedly, this isn't just about aluminum and zinc. It's gonna have knock on implications to individuals heating their homes and making anything because you can't really manufacture anything without relatively inexpensive natural gas. So I don't love what this chart potentially entails as we roll into colder months ahead. Um, and admittedly, you know, I think I'll reference Jurassic Park here real quick, you know, chaos theory, the idea of a butterfly flapping its wings somewhere. When you've got energy markets that are this tight, the smallest little tweaks in supply, the smallest little tweaks in supply chains can really cause very dramatic knock-on impacts because the supply demand balances right now within energy are such that, you know, you, you get one fire at one facility, you could see prices double or triple or, or or just you, you can't even get it at any price. So again, not I don't wanna belabor the point, but the energy situation is really, really bad within, within Europe right now. A warmer winter could certainly help alleviate that. But I guess the one other thing I would say about this is we're talking about Europe here. This is a you know, set of developed nations. If we're talking about Europe having these types of issues, we're not seeing a lot of headlines about it, but you can imagine that second world countries, third world countries, are likely having these issues and then some because if you know if prices are doing this in Europe they're probably unavailable in, in third world countries and I almost wasn't going to provide this chart because it's kind of a, a uh, there's new news about this in the last couple hours but what this is looking at is the flows of natural gas through Nord Stream 1 pipeline so this is the pipeline taking natural gas from Russia to Germany um, you can see that September through, let's say, June, it was relatively steady. This is in milli million cubic meters of natural gas. You're, you're probably noticing, well, what happened in July? Well, in July, and I will admit, every single year right around mid-July, Russia does take scheduled maintenance where they, they bring production down. And, and production literally goes to zero for a, period, a short period of time. You can see it, it, it was for a short period of time, but it hasn't recovered anywhere near to the levels of where it was running, let's say September through, through June. Is it actual maintenance or are they playing games? I have no idea. I don't really wanna speculate on that, but it is worth noting that just this morning, and, and this data is not updated for that, just this morning they announced another round of maintenance. Um, again, I don't know if that's them trying to remind Europe that, hey, we, we have our hands on the spigot, or if this is truly you know, a temporary maintenance, but. What I will say, uh, admittedly, is that the latest piece of data suggests that come Saturday, it, the maintenance should be completed and we should start to see these flows ramp back up. We'll see, we're gonna keep a close eye on that, but obviously given the tightness of energy within Europe, 
this is a very important topic as it stands here today. And then lastly, a, a little bit of uh, levity, a little bit of lightness. Um, the US dollar, which has been incredibly strong over the, over the last year, year and a half, um, it has finally gone beyond parity with the Euro, the Euro dollar. Um, parity basically just means it went to one, one to one. It became equal to uh, the Euro. Hasn't happened in a while. And, uh, and I, I found this tweet kind of hilarious. So I, I don't know who Mr. Cuddles is, but I wish I came up with this joke on my own. Since the dollar has gone to parity, his, his comment is, it's now called soccer. It's no longer football. Nothing we can do about it. Um, the good news for anybody listening to this, this, this uh, podcast here, if you're heading to Europe, it's gotten a whole lot cheaper in the last year and a half. So you may not have any lights on in your cafe, but you can certainly go there cheaper right now. You know, Nick, when you look at the energy in general across the world, and you talk about the United States in general, if you go back, um, I mean, even to hear about in California, they're asking folks to not charge their electric vehicles, right? I mean, and, and it's, it's um, you know, with, with the mandate to, to get an electric vehicle by, I think it was 2035 or something like that, but now we're really seeing a grid that can't support it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a real issue for, for the energy, like your, like your shape. And I think it's just, it's fascinating. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't mean to laugh about it fully. I mean, it, these are very serious issues and, and might wind up in very serious consequences for humanity. And again, I don't want to, I don't want to be too hyperbolic here, but, but I will say that the headline, I mean, and they happen within several days of one another, California mandated electric vehicle sales starting in 2035. But just yesterday, they also came out and said, do your best not to charge your electric vehicles. So you do have you do have some conflicting messages going on within within even the United States. Um, so yeah, we it's it's a tricky one. I mean, there are some there are a lot of political ramifications here, obviously. But we we as a society, whether it's on a regional basis or global basis, just probably need to revisit the the prioritization prioritization table and and determine what what we find most important. And that's going to be touching on some pretty important topics like climate, like. Um, energy security, like national security, and uh, and all those things are, are interrelated right now. Yeah, okay. great. So with that being said, um, after all the doom and gloom, I want to dish it off to somebody who's far less gloomy than I am. Um, Jeff Notice, he is a director of supply chain within Ryerson. He's been in the business, let's see, 24, 25 years. So he's a, he's a wealth of information, far better within the, the metals world than I am. And I think what you'll really be able to glean from him you know, I oftentimes touch on the ingot side of the aluminum market. What, what Jeff gets the luxury of doing is, I don't know if we can call it a luxury, but he gets uh, to spend well, more, of, <laughs> more, more of his time dealing and interfacing directly with the physical mills. So anything regarding lead times, um, you know, product quality, things like that, he's going to be much more suited to answer those types of questions. But Jeff, kick it over to you. Sure. Yep. And uh Nick, I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to start off with aluminum extrusions, just kind of a brief overview of where we have seen really probably the last six months to a year to where things have gone, even let's call it the last 30 to 60 days. But on the extrusion side, and in particular on the soft alloy extrusion side, uh, we saw relatively strong demand. We saw some labor shortages that were occurring at the mill level. Um, those have continued all the way through the first half of 2022, uh, but going into the second half of 2022, we're starting to see that loosen up. Um, lead times have improved pretty significantly over the last 30 to 60 days, um, not only at kind of the major soft alloy extrusion mills, uh, but also from the regional extruders. Uh, the one exception there would be on the, the, the hard alloy or the cold finish bar products. Um, those lead times continue to be pretty extended and on-time delivery seems to be a, a struggle at the, uh, the cold finish side of the equation. Uh, as, as far as just standard shapes go, bar products, uh, channel angle, uh, those type of products, those lead times are now back down to what we call traditional levels. Uh, let's call it three to five week range. Some are actually even better than the three to five week range, but that's, that's the average. On the custom shape side, extended lead times have continued. Uh, but I would tell you over the last 30 to 60 days, those values have come in seven to eight weeks. So on average, custom shapes are, are running, let's call it 25 to 35 weeks. Um, we do have one press that uh, I saw this week that's still out to a 45 week time frame. 
Um, allocation has been in place. We've seen that really over the last year or so. Uh, but as lead times start to, to, to come in, I would expect some of our major soft alloy extrusion mills to, to start to eliminate some of the allocation and will live off of what the production lead time is, along with some of the depot that is starting to go. Um, from a depot standpoint, I wouldn't say we're quite at pre-pandemic levels, uh, but some of the majors, some of the Kaisers and the Hedros of the world are starting to build their depot inventories back up, Spanish Fork, Persona, some other locations that, uh, that it's building. And we do anticipate going through the second half with some of the softening that we're seeing in the market that those depots will continue to build. Uh, for US Canada, for the first half of 2022 versus 2021, we have seen shipments up. Primarily that's being driven from automotive demand and building construction demand. Uh, but we also are seeing it in some other areas like Manifold Bar uh, for the fluid power market. As we go into the second half of 2022, again, if you talk to many of our soft alloy extrusion mills, they do anticipate that the, uh, the market will soften um, and that we'll see lead times continue to be narrowed down. Depots will continue to build and there might be a little bit of a retraction on how much shipments go out. Next slide. Really almost the, uh, the, the same story as it relates to plate and flat mills. Uh, in particular on the plate side, strong demand allocation has been in place, certainly through the first half of 2022. Uh, on the common alloy side though, we are starting to see some softening on that market segment as well. Not so much on the plate or the heat treat plate side. Uh, import offerings, those have really been dramatically reduced all the way back to when anti-dumping and countervailing duties were applied. That would have been back in uh, first quarter of 2021. Um, it's really made many of our import providers uh, uncompetitive to a domestic alternative. And then if you include some of the 232 tariffs, uh, favored nation that would be in play, uh, vessel costs, container costs, and some of the delays that we've had in getting material through port, um, it just made them less and less attractive um, for current state as, as it relates to the common alloy side of the equation. Uh, domestic mills still sold out, although again, there is some loosening on the common alloy side. And hot mill capacity, really on the hot band side, that was more of a story maybe nine to 12 months ago. Uh, but there is some announcements with some maintenance that will be happening here in the second half of 2022 for hot mill capacity. Uh, as a general rule on the common alloy lead time, uh, we're running right around eight to 10 weeks across all domestic mills on the DC side. On a continuous cast side, that's a little bit in a tighter supply as there's less uh, suppliers that are, are producing continuous cast product. Uh, heat treat plate is extended. All three of the major domestic mills that produce heat treat plate have indicated to me that they're fully allocated out, primarily based off of strong demand on the semiconductor sector. Uh, but there has actually been a little bit of an uptick on the aerospace side as well. And they do anticipate that that allocation and tight supply for things like 6061, 2024, 7075 heat treat plate, that those will continue to be uh, tight throughout 2023. Hey, hey, Jeff, a good go quick question, Brian. On, on the flat side, I, I know Ryerson doesn't do a ton into tier one automotive, but uh, could, can you speak to anything on the flat side with regards to automotive demand, uh, whether we're seeing any pickup there? Um, is the shift to EV or, or light weighting of vehicles having much of a, a noticeable impact within within the I think it is. I think you know the, the general theme that we've heard is on the automotive side. The demand may be out there, but they they are struggling like many uh, companies out there with getting other supplies to finish off the product. Um, that seems to be continuing. I think there's optimism that might be turning the corner in the first half of 2023, but I hear less and less optimism that that's going to be an uptick going through the balance of 2022. Got it, thank you. Surcharges, I won't go into you know, a lot of detail around surcharges, but as we get into the, uh, the contract timeframe where we're doing some negotiation for 2023 type of agreements, um, we are kind of seeing a new wrinkle or a newer wrinkle with the, uh, the surcharge side of, of, of the equation with uh, magnesium in particular, uh, but some of our suppliers 
are calling it a hardener surcharge, which could consist of magnesium, manganese, silicone, copper. Um, the challenging part as we go through balance of this year and as we go into negotiations for 2023 is each one of our domestic partners, and I would say that there's five of them that are out there, um, are doing things completely differently from the other supplier as it relates to surcharge. So we're kind of working through that. There's a lot of different wrinkles that are going on, but in the example of Arconic, um, they will be changing their surcharge mechanism going into 2023. And instead of including just magnesium, it will include magnesium, manganese, silicone, and copper, and a fuel and freight surcharge component to it. So it's getting a little bit more complex. Um, these surcharges vary by mill as far as when they make the changes. Some of them are changing on a monthly basis. Some are changing them on a quarterly basis. Some are, are putting them into a family. So any three series would be at one surcharge. 5,000 would be at another surcharge. Uh, going into 2023. Some of them are going from that family of an alloy over to specific alloys. So 5052 would be a specific surcharge, 5083, 5086, and so on. So just something to look out for, but it's uh, it's definitely a new wrinkle in comparison to what we work on from a costing standpoint for, for common alloy products in the past. Yeah, and it's a good segue from, from some of the topics I had touched on with regards to kind of energy prices, electricity prices, because if you remember back, what was it, September or October of last year, when energy markets within China got tight and they had to start rationing production of certain things, that was when we got the original uh, magnesium issue. So I would say that that risk may not be huge yet, but it's still certainly on the table. Yeah. As a, the, the other thing I'd mentioned, MAG being the primary one that's out there, we are starting to see that number start to uh, reduce. Um, at, at a high, if you go back to, to March of this year, uh, that number would have been around 910. Now it's down to around 650, 750 range. So there has been a little bit of a correction in the, uh, the MAG side of the equation. Next slide. So this is more of just a, a couple of announcements that, that came out on some fully integrated uh, uh, facilities that will be coming into play. It's a little little ways off. Both of them are in, into 2025, but both of them are primarily going to be focused in on um, canned sheet production along with auto sheet production. Uh, Steel Dynamics has indicated some of their production will go into common alloy products. Um, and Novellus, even though the, the, uh, the primary production will be canned sheet, and auto sheet, um, it will provide some relief off of their Kingston and Oswego facilities that do produce common alloys. So there should be some benefits as we go towards 2025. A lot of this push is gonna be off of a green initiative, uh, low carbon. I know in the case of Novellus, their push is to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. You heard a lot of that theme uh, from many of our domestic partners. Um, again, those are off into 2025. Steel Dynamics, we're hearing that will be a play for uh, Q1 of 2025. Um, the, the, the numbers, they may look big, uh, but if you do take some of what the analysts are projecting out there, um, we do believe that there's gonna be a deficit about uh, 2 million tons uh, that are needing to be replaced. We're not getting a lot of imported product that's coming in. Uh, so this will support it, but it's gonna be a couple of years off. Um, so there could continue to be a, a pretty tight uh, supply on common alloy, especially if we get markets like can sheet and automotive uh, that start to spike. Awesome, really great information. Um, Mike, I don't know, do, do you wanna do you wanna do any questions now or should we hold them until the end? Yeah, we got a few, um, but I was gonna note here, it's, it's nice to see that um, can production is on both of these. I, I literally read an article the other day that brewers across the country are dealing with a shortage of aluminum cans. So um, just a little added there. Um, a question from the audience, um, speaking specifically to a fire at the Faircrest mill of Timken Steel, um, do you know if that's affected deliveries at all? You wanna touch on that, Nick, or? Want me to? You got it. Yeah, I think I, I, we we believe it will to some capacity, but I think we're still working through what effects that's going to have overall. Um, it certainly was a pretty significant announcement that 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 came out on the steel side, um, but we are working through it. Um, 
that's that's kind of my my latest update on it. Gotcha. And there was another question about do you uh, when do you anticipate aluminum mills starting to lock up twenty twenty three contracts? Is there any word on that? That's it's happening right now, and we've already started it, uh, both on the direct chill and on the continuous cast side. Gotcha. Um, less so less 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 uh, on the soft alloy extrusion. That seems like that's a little bit more delayed, but uh, we are definitely into the uh, uh, the contract uh, the season currently. Yeah, and I would say that's true for that's true for carbon, and that's true for stainless as well. Okay, great. Yeah, did, well, uh, did, did Jeff uh, just yeah. have a uh, an enforced power outage on his end? Well, that's just that's that's just energy. <laughs> We're trying to conserve. I thought they were, thought they were doing rolling blackouts in Minneapolis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would, I would add though, you know, I mentioned the common alloy. We are in negotiation period, but if there are people that are on the call right now that uh, uh, may buy um, heat treat product, so 6061, 2024, 7075, um, because of how tight that market is, if you haven't looked to uh, procure for 2023, uh, probably now is a very good time to, to get ahead of it. Great stuff. Jeff, we, we asked you to uh, stick around for another, let's say, 15, 20 minutes for when we wrap up the rest of the medals, and then there could be some further Q&A for you. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm on. Awesome. My lights might turn off. But... <laughs> Perfect. Um, so continuing on the aluminum ingot side of things, we've looked at this chart many times in the past, but this is ultimately the price of LME aluminum ingot. So basically the commodity piece of, of aluminum. It's come off fairly rapidly in the last several months uh, on the back of. I would say mainly on the back of, of China continuing to lock down um, dollar strength, those things are, are having kind of a dual pronged impact on the price of aluminum. And as we sit here today, literally on this day, this is the lowest price we've seen for LME aluminum ingot in the last year. So are, are we getting into value, value ter territory? Are we nearing a bottom? You know, if we use today as a proxy, it's looking like no. Um, but I've got a couple things that I'll show here in a few slides that might suggest, you know, we, we, we potentially are nearing an area where we find some support. Uh, looking down at the below section, this is, again, the relative strength index. So this looks, this is a gauge of momentum to determine whether things are overbought, oversold, kind of sitting in neutral territory. And with an RSI, relative strength index, of around 36, as we sit here today, uh, a 30 is what's generally considered to be oversold. And so we're, we're nearing that range. So from a technical standpoint, it wouldn't be totally shocking if you see some traders step in and start buying some of these contracts. That's, that's mainly from, from kind of a momentum, uh, kind of counter cyclical standpoint. From the fundamental side of things, I know we talked about, we talked about this chart last month and we've, and we've talked about energy markets quite a bit on this, on this discussion. But I wanna, I wanna revisit this because I think it's an important one, which is, the higher or longer energy markets stay elevated or, or perhaps even go higher and it becomes difficult for, for aluminum smelters to procure energy to, to melt or to smelt, um, the more difficult it is for them to make money when prices are around a dollar to a dollar ten cents. It's estimated that right now on a global basis about 23 percent of smelters globally are unprofitable at current levels. So what that means, just kind of eyeballing it, let's say, you know, this chart represents all of global production going left to right. That's about 70 million tons of production. Basically, you're saying 50 to only about 50 to 55 million tons is currently profitable. And that's it. That's at like a buck oh five to a buck ten. If we start getting to a dollar or, or even below a dollar, you actually work your way pretty far down this curve all the way down to where about 50%, 5-0% of aluminum smelters become unprofitable. Now in the short term, they can do that. They can produce some tons for a couple of months and do it unprofitably. But if that persists, a lot of these smelters will start to ask the question, should I, should I curtail production because I'm not making money doing it? And, uh, and I think that's a real risk within aluminum. I think that's a risk within zinc and, uh, and, and maybe a lesser, to a lesser degree in, in copper and nickel. But, um, but it's certainly an issue within aluminum, just given its its energy intensity uh, for making the product. Well, you've seen some of that already, right, Nick? I mean, exactly. Yeah. Sensory Aluminum came out with their uh, their shutdown. I think Norway globally, there was some smelters in China as well. 
I just right. don't think they've been significant enough yet to, you know, cause a, a spike back up in, in LME rates. Yeah, you can imagine behind the scenes, a lot of these, you know, management teams are probably having the discussion, but but no action yet taken at this stage. Um, probably probably a lot of eyes looking at the at the power markets as we see here today. Similarly, you know, other, other things declining will be the Midwest premiums. Part of the premiums declining is in direct conjunction with the fact that the LME price, the LME ingot cost has gone down because there is a tariff on aluminum if we import it. Um, so as the price of ingots coming down, that tariff also decreases. The other factor, which I think we've talked about in prior discussions is the freight markets are actually, they seem to be loosening up a little bit. And what we're looking at here is the uh, truckstop.com index for freight. So this is looking at the number of available loads relative to the demand for those loads, and they compile an index. And that index is suggesting that if we assume this relationship holds up, we should probably continue to see pressure on Midwest premiums as we roll through the coming weeks and months ahead. So right now, I think the official number today just dipped below 25 cents. So it's been been a little bit since we've seen prices below 25 cents on uh, on premiums. Certainly, certainly this year. Flipping over to the carbon side of things, uh, I feel like I want to play the Jimmy Buffett song when it all falls down because that's really the theme of, of what's been going on within carbon sheet. Um, whether it's Chinese prices in orange, European prices in blue, U.S. prices in white, all of them are, are converging to the downside, and 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 also the spreads between all of them are also tight to a, to a fairly large degree. So much so that it's getting to a point where really importing European product or, or product from, from overseas, it's not all that cost competitive these days. So that's that's part of the reason why I'm beginning to think we're, we kind of are bouncing along somewhere near a bottom um, because because the import threat is no longer there. So that's, that's something from the supply side of things that I think is gonna keep prices uh, somewhat supported from here. Now, famous last words, hopefully nothing else too crazy happens and, and the, the bottom falls out. If we also similarly use scrap prices as a proxy for where, where fair value might be, we've looked at this chart in the past, but this is looking at bushling scrap futures, adding on $300, um, comparing that to where the US hot rail futures market is, they've pretty much converged. Um, and even in some cases, the futures market is actually at a discount to where scrap plus $300 is. The reason why we use scrap plus 300 Ultimately, for electric arc furnaces here within North America, they're making steel from scrap in a lot of cases. We're, we're estimating that fixed spread to be for them to make money at somewhere around $300. That, uh, that allows them to cover labor, energy, logistics, things like that. Um, so as I sit here today, there are a number of factors that seem to be suggesting we're nearing the trough. Now, I don't, I don't think that necessarily means we have to scream off the lows and head back to 1,000. But it does feel like the momentum to the downside is, is quickly waning uh, for those factors. And maybe, maybe not coincidentally, uh, I think two or three mills just in the last week or two have already announced 50 or $75 price increases. So some of that might have been to slow the bleed. Some of that might have been because they're looking at some of these same factors where they're saying enough's enough. We're actually getting into a reasonable range. Now, where I've been dead wrong is on the price of uh, steel plate. So steel plate uh, continues to levitate. We got the CRU numbers just uh, yesterday and hot roll was down, cold roll was down, galvanized is down and plate went up. <laughs> it is, uh, it's got me scratching my head. I, I will readily wave the, the white flag and, and say, I, I give up. I, I don't know and I don't have a great explanation for this except for one thing. My, my analyst, Kevin, uh, who is far better at this work than I am, he, uh, he pointed this out to me yesterday that the Dodge construction index is screaming right now. And, and granted, this data is a little lag. This is, this is as of July 31st is the most recent data point. But perhaps there's something to this story of given the fact that the plate market is a little smaller, there are fewer players, um, it's maybe easier to cause extreme tightness within that space relative to carbon sheet. And what do we have going on right now that we didn't have, say, last year, the infrastructure bill? Um, I don't know if you can hear the, the background noise right now, but as we sit here right now, there are probably 
30 rows of plate sitting on the road and there is massive amounts of construction going out outside right here downtown Chicago. Um, there's a real potential that, that this is just a situation whereby demand is hot. It's a smaller, it's a smaller market than carbon sheet. So it's easier to keep it elevated when demand's as strong as it is. And, uh, and to give a little, little clarification, the Dodge, Dodge construction index is similar to the PMI data in that it's, it's soft data, it's a survey. It's basically asking people, how do they feel? So it's not exactly representative of construction spending. It's basically how do those in the construction market feel about things right now? And right now they're feeling pretty darn good. So I don't know, I, I'm, I'm happy to admit that I'm wrong on plate prices. I thought they'd come crashing down much faster. I still think there's probably room for them to come down a bit, but we look at the construction world we look outside my window, uh, there's a lot going on right now with, with regards to, uh, to infrastructure. That speaks greatly to what Brian Crane told us last month too, right? The limited pool of suppliers and the infrastructure, just the, the market demand, like you said. I mean, I think those are definitely the factors keeping that. Yeah, because I mean, if you take a step back and you say, well, construction is hot, that's why plate's hot. I mean, I would potentially make the argument to say, okay, well then steel sheet should also be hot because steel sheet goes into these things as well. But yeah, I think I think to Brian's point and to the point you just mentioned, because plate is smaller, it's just easier to kind of push it around, I suppose. Lastly, not to forget about stainless, the nickel side of things, it looks a lot like the rest of the base metals complex where things were trying to get a little bit of a holding. Um, and then in the last couple of days, we got some fairly negative news out of China where they're having continued zero COVID policies locking down that's feeding through to depressed pricing within really the entire base metals complex. And, and nickel is no exception. We're back down into the low $9 per pound range. Um, we're below all three of the moving averages from a, a momentum standpoint. And, and similar to aluminum, we're kind of in the low 30s for, for the relative strength index. So there's, there's a lot of pressure right now across a lot of these metals. The question is, do traders step in and say, enough's enough, let's start, to, let's start to buy some of this and take some positions. We're seeing a little bit of it within our customer base on hedging. Um, I still personally think that there's a little bit more of an argument to be made around aluminum than there is around nickel. That's just my personal opinion. And, and really that just centers around the idea of the cost of making it. That if you're trying to find a floor, the, the cost of making the product is a pretty good rough start to, to you know, kind of put your finger up and say, this is around where prices should begin to bottom um, because if they don't bottom there, more and more producers shut down. In the case of nickel, uh, we're not really near cost support yet based on, based on the, the estimates I've seen. Cost support really doesn't kick in until I'd say $8, maybe even, maybe even six, $7. So we're a ways away from that marginal cost of production within the nickel world. Doesn't mean it can't find support above that, but I just think the dynamics within nickel are a little different than, than the aluminum space. And the other thing kind of weighing on the nickel market sentiment overall, I know we've talked about this in months past, but this is the open interest, which is just a fancy way of saying volumes traded within the London Metal Exchange nickel contract. And you can see that since the short squeeze that occurred that drove prices to the moon, uh, traders have left the market. So banks have probably left the market. Traders participating in the market have left. And that just decreases liquidity. It, it decreases the number of eyes who are watching the market. So that, that can sometimes lead to disjointed market conditions. It can lead to just kind of dull market conditions. But, you know, put a number on it, the, the volume traded is down about 31% since, since that short squeeze. So it's, it's a meaningful number. Um, and uh, yet we, we haven't yet seen that recover. So with that, I'm done rambling on. We uh, happy to take some, some questions if there are any.